John Gwaltzka. John Gwaltzka? I think I'm pretty sure I got the John right anyway. Hi, John. What are your thoughts on the OIG report? Mine are, oh, that'd be the uh, Office of Inspector General. Mine are that neither Hillary or Comey nor Strusk or anyone else will ever see justice for their part in the worst political scandals in U.S. history and the fitted swamp that D.C., that is D.C., will remain undrained in perpetuity. I'm inclined to want to agree with you on this. I think I mentioned last week or the week before, I still occasionally wake up with this, you know, half awake, half asleep thing in the morning, thinking, oh, maybe what's going to happen is uh, I'll turn on the TV and there will be um, sessions. And I'll be reading uh, a list of indictments that he's been working on intensely for the, and, and in complete secrecy for the last 18 months or two years or whatever, but it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, somebody just uh, um, <laughs> Puddle Pirate says this damaged generation votes and that's something that I think needs to be said too this damaged generation does vote and this generation was damaged intentionally in order to get the voting result they wanted. This is what the left does. They will ru rule over the ruins. They don't care if uh, inner city America's lives are destroyed. They don't care if black America disintegrates. They don't care if, if 8,000 black people are murdered every year. They say they care, but they don't. What matters is, is that they get the votes. And if that means turning adults into children or not letting them ever become adults so that they vote like children, which means vote Democrat, then that's what they'll do. The, the morality of it is so reprehensible and disgusting that that every time one of these people tries to take the moral high ground with me, it's just like I'm, I'm like a pit bull on, you know, on the chain. Just let me loose. I'm going to tear these people up. Anyway, back to John's uh, question. Um, John, the thing with Hillary is not just that Hillary Clinton broke the law, and it's not just that she got away with it. What Hillary Clinton did was she broke the rule of law. She broke the idea of the rule of law. We all cooperate in the society because we had the quaint idea, true once, that no matter how much money we had or how, um, how well off or how badly off we were, how powerful or how helpless, that the law applied equally to everybody. Not so naive to say that if I got in trouble and I had a good lawyer versus a bad lawyer, I would do better with the good lawyer. That's absolutely true. But nevertheless, the law was the law, and the law applied to everybody the same. Um, when somebody could commit felonies and treasons on the scale of Hillary Clinton and get away with it, the half of the country that voted for her has no respect for the law anyway. They're the kind of people who... You know, if you can change an election result after the fact, do it. If you can change the voting rules to get your person in, do it. And then if it helps a Republican after that, change it back and then change it back again. They don't have any, any sense of integrity or any sense of playing by the rules. They're, they're uh, you know, they're, um, they're ours. Uh, so they don't care. And... Um, and the problem for the country is, is that the people who do care about the rule of law still are becoming convinced that, um, that it simply just doesn't exist anymore. Because, because this woman's, um, the scale of, of, of Hillary and Bill and Chelsea's, uh, felonies and misdemeanors is so overwhelming. I mean, put Hillary Clinton, just if you can find a hole deep enough and well sealed enough, just put Hillary Clinton aside for a minute. That's what we ought to do with Yucca Mountain, by the way. Yucca Mountain is where we ought to inter the, the Clintons um, so that they don't poison another generation, you know, for 200,000 years until their half-life is reached or whatever the case may be, because they're such toxic, horrible people. But put aside all the things we know that Hillary did. It's just open knowledge that the Clinton Foundation is a criminal enterprise, but even put that aside, the Clinton Foundation raised something like $100 million, and somebody saw their tax returns, and, um, 
And the Clinton Foundation, I think, raised $60, $70 million in one year. And of that $70 million that this charitable tax-free organization raised, $70 million, something like $4 million went to charities. In other words, $4 million out of the $70 million that they raised went to the purpose it was intended to go to, at least what they claimed it to. It all went to the purpose it was intended to go to, except for that $7 million, because the intention of the Clinton Foundation was to raise money tax-free to enrich the Clintons. And since they have no standards of any kind whatsoever, I have not been able to detect any moral standards among any of the three of them. Not, not at all. You can make yourself fairly tidy living if you are in a position of power earned from a lifetime of scheming and backbiting and destroying enemies, destroying uh, uh, reputations, destroying emotional lives, destroying people's um, families. And in many cases, I have to say, statistically, um, as a person who's dead set against conspiracy theories and is exceedingly skeptical of them, um, nevertheless, the number of people who, who stumble into strange accidental deaths after revealing or about to reveal something of the Clintons is higher than I think any reasonable statistician would be willing to grant. So I suspect you could make a fairly compelling case that there's a, some actual murder going on back there. Certainly the appearance of it. And, and there, I think there's no question about the rape. There's, there's absolutely no question about the embezzlement, about the lying, about perjury, about, about treason. All of that's just, just open, open. Um... And when they walk, it tells all of the little people, that would be us, that um, you can get away with murder and everything else if you're a Democrat, and if you pay the right people. And I have to say, I've been so impressed with Donald Trump, uh, his foreign policy, the economy, unemployment's lower than it's been in 44 years. I think the way he handled this Kim thing is just absolute genius. And there's a number of excellent things you can say about him, including his tax cuts, which restarted the economy. Obama said there's no magic button you can just push, you know, to restart the economy. Turns out there is. And turns out you know it because we've been telling you about it. And you've already admitted, Obama, before he was elected, that even if he could be proven to him that lowering the tax rate would actually increase federal revenues, he didn't want to do it. He, he said the most important thing is to level the playing fields, get the rich. So... Um, when, when I look at Trump and, and look at the things he's done, I'm so impressed. And yet, the, the, the signal failure so far, and he better hurry, because you're going to need the House and the Senate for this, is I have not seen any, of all the people that Donald Trump should have fired first, I would have fired Jeff Sessions within a month. Because I didn't see anything. I don't see anything that Jeff Sessions has done at all. And um, I keep thinking, oh, he's all in secret. He's all preparing the case. I suspect not. But Comey is a, you know, is a lunatic. He's, a, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's just kind of a psychopath. And you hear of FBI agents sending texts to other FBI agents saying that they're going to use the power of the FBI to make sure that Donald Trump gets, doesn't get elected. You know, we're... We were just 70,000 votes away um, a year and a half ago from having Hillary Clinton's sensible shoes on our neck for the next thousand years. Um, so we have a limited amount of time to do this. I thought we were going to get shell shellacked in November. And I still think that's likely, but not as likely and not as bad because despite the, the best efforts of the news media and um, entertainment, the whole thing. You know, I have to go through this litany again. Despite their, their frantic, hysterical efforts, people are aware of the fact that this is the best economy in 44 years, and they're aware of the, tech that, the fact that they can get jobs where they didn't before, and they're aware of the fact that their, their businesses are making more money, they're taking home more money as employees. And all the things they hate about Trump and being just such an idiot and so nasty and vulgar, it's a little... 
um, confusing to these people when they find out that, uh, you know, Donald Trump, who's apparently such a, uh, you know, vulgar, crass, incompetent, managed to bring the Olympics to the United States when Obama specifically went on a trip to do it and didn't get it. He got the World Cup to the Olympics. He seems to have ended the Korean War, certainly put it down the path of that. He backed Iran out of the deal that was going to guarantee them nuclear weapons, put them on notice. You may remember ISIS. Um, that name was on our lips quite a bit during the last eight years. I don't hear much about them anymore, and that's because they largely don't exist anymore. Far be it for me to be the kind of person who says, oh, we don't have to worry about that. That problem's beaten now. No. Uh, ISIS is, and Al-Qaeda and all the rest of these things, these, are, these, these organizations are like rust. They'll never go away. Rust never sleeps, and, and you have to mow the grass. And if you don't, then you get weeds. But certainly, ISIS is not the threat it used to be when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State and Barack Obama was President. I was talking about this with my wife last night, and we were talking about um, this whole thing and how the President of the United States, it's on record, and certainly one of our viewers knows the inside uh, details of what goes on at CENTCOM because he got me into CENTCOM. It took them half an hour to sanitize the place before I came in, meaning, you know, making sure there was nothing secret on the screens and all the rest of it. But that was nothing compared to after I left. It took them two and a half hours to sanitize the place after I left, you know, because of the smell and all the spill food and everything. Um, but when the president of the United States gets a call from the people on the ground, the, the commander of CENTCOM, CENTCOM's where all the action is. CENTCOM used to be the, the, the waste paper basket that you threw all the people with no careers into, but now everything is happening in the world happens at CENTCOM, Central Command, based in Tampa. And it deals with Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran and Israel, I think, all the rest of it. So ISIS is growing more and more powerful. They're murdering people everywhere. They're just simply slaughtering people by the, by the scores, putting people in cages and setting them on fire, lining up 25, 30 people in orange jumpsuits on a beach, slitting all their throats, all of this stuff. And when these charming people decide um, that uh, they're going to take a convoy of trucks with oil that they've stolen and they're going to run 150 trucks to some port, some place, probably Basra, I don't know that for a fact, but they're going to take the oil to sell it so they can buy more guns and explosives so they can kill more people in nightclubs in Brussels and Paris. And the President of the United States, Commander-in-Chief, gets a call that says, Sir, we have eyes on a convoy, 150 strong. It's going to be on the road for three or four hours. It's moving. This is what our entire military is built for. We are here for this. The A-10 and, and our ground assets, Apache helicopters, all of these things are designed to destroy tanks and motorized vehicles. That's what the U.S. military is built to do, destroy motorized vehicles. And um, there's 150 of them, and they're heading for the Gulf, and they're out in the open, and we got them cold. Let's pull the trigger, why don't we? And the word comes from the President of the United States. Well, I guess we can, but to be fair... We should give them some warning. We need to we need to give them forty five minutes warning. Warning, warn them that in forty five minutes we're going to attack. I can't imagine what that must have looked like at CENTCOM. I know somebody who can't imagine it, but I don't know what that must look like if you're an actual war fighter in uniform to hear that hear that come down. How does that work? Am I supposed to call the ISIS hotline? Am I supposed to, is it, is it, do they have a phone number like that special number you call into radio stations so that you can be the interviewee, not the regular line? Who the hell do you call to give ISIS a warning? But true enough, it's actually true. It happened many times. The, the strikes were either called off or they were said, you have to give them a warning. And when they give them a warning, guess what happens to the convoy? The convoy disperses. All the trucks go in separate directions and then they just take them out slowly or they wait till some other time. They get the money they need to do the murdering they want to. And that's Barack Obama. And then, what was it, day two? Two or three was certainly within the first week. There's a known ISIS uh, group in, um, it might have been Al-Qaeda, I suspect it was ISIS. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, ISIS uh, guys in a bunch of uh, caves up in Afghanistan, up in the hills. 
why don't we use some thero- thermobaric bombs on them, Commander-in-Chief? You know, the kind of things that suck the air out of the tunnels and then light it on fire? And this time, the President of the United States, in conjunction with the Secretary of Defense, uh, um, Mad Dog Mattis, which is the exact precise nickname you want for a Secretary of Defense, and I've been saying that for 10 years now, when you have a Secretary of Defense whose nickname is Mad Dog, you are, you are in secure hands and your country is as safe as it's going to be. Um, so somebody along the line said, you know, Mr. President, uh, we certainly have the, the, the munitions to deal with this little problem. As a matter of fact, we've got a lot more munition than we have holes in the mountainside, sir. You want to explain that to me? We actually have a weapon that is much more powerful than the one that we need to use to do the job. What is this weapon called? It's called the... Um, Massive Ordnance uh, Airburst Device uh, Bomb. Massive Ordnance Air. It's Moab, and um, it's also known as the mother of all bombs. It's a giant canister. It's enormous. It's so big they can't launch it from bombers. They have to push it out the back of a C-130 Hercules transport. It's this enormous, enormous cylinder, and it comes out of the back of the transport. It's got a couple steering vanes on it and a GPS device. Not that you have to get terribly, terribly close to your target when you're dropping the mother of all bombs. And what happens is, as this thing comes down in the ground, hits the ground, but instead of exploding, what it does is it ruptures that enormous tank of it that it's got and pushes out this mixture of um, essentially propane. It's flammable gas. And there's a delayed fuse there so that the bomb hits the the, the flammable gas expands into this huge area, and then that's ignited. And it is the largest non-nuclear weapon we have in the arsenal. We said it was the largest non-nuclear weapon in the world, but the Russians, of course, uh, and I know some Russians, can't let America have the biggest bomb in the world, so uh, they basically say that they have the father of all bombs, which presumably has twice the yield or... 40% more yield than the mother of all bombs. And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if they've ever tested it or not. But I know that the Moab works because uh, I saw the one film footage that they did back in the mid-2000s when they first invented it. And then I saw what's left of that hill after they used it on, on these people. So why am I diverging down this long, long story? Well, when you give ISIS 45 minutes warning that you're going to attack them, ISIS gets stronger every day. When you decide to use the most massive weapon we have that's not a nuclear weapon, and, and essentially smash mosquitoes with a sledgehammer, you are saying to them, this is not the game that you were playing before and the rules are different now and you're not going to like this new game. And that's why over the last 18 year, uh, months, we've not heard much from ISIS. You know why we haven't mer- heard much from ISIS? The answer is because there's not many ISIS left anymore. And the reason there's not much ISIS left anymore is because the extraordinarily capable people who, who deal with ISIS on a daily basis finally had their hands untied and were allowed to do their jobs. And if the President of the United States had untied the hands of his military when he became Commander-in-Chief, there'd be people in Brussels and Paris and a number of other places, Africa, school children, who would be alive today because ISIS would not have become as strong as they would because ISIS was strong because people thought you could basically tweak the nose of the great Satan and get away with it. Once they find out you can't get away with it, the number of recruitment uh, drives you need goes way up. It's astonishing how few people you get when it turns into sudden death instead of glory. So, um, this is all not just the Clintons. It's it's the it's the left. They are for lawlessness in every form. They have no. You used to be able to disagree with Democrats about policy, but honestly, I don't – this modern progressive group, this Saul Alinsky group, I don't, I don't know what their core beliefs are because I just don't think they have any. I think if, if Hillary Clinton could have been president and she was sure she would have been president by running as a conservative Republican, she would have done it in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. 
Yes, we did a few other, uh, few other explosives at the end of Vietnam, but uh, what, uh, Ayoyas. But uh, yeah, the daisy cutter bomb, you drop in the middle of the forest canopy and it would do the same thing, but it had a radius of, I don't know, what, 50 meters, something like that, maybe a little more. But this thing is basically a daisy cutter made large. So the lesson of this is, I think you're right, John. I don't think the Clintons are going to go to jail. I don't think Obama's going to go to jail. And because they don't go to jail, their philosophy does not get discredited the way it needs to be discredited, which means it will happen again. We'll get it again. If we'd had the sense to go in and prosecute these people and get convictions against them, my feeling would have been the smart thing to do would have been get convictions on Hillary Clinton, get felony convictions on her and Bill Clinton, if it's what I would do if I was President Trump. I would get felony convictions. I'd get them, I'd get them arrested. I'd get the mug shots. I would get them, um, I'd make them do the perp walk. I would get them convicted. I'd get them sentenced. And once they were sentenced as president, I would not pardon them. I would commute their sentence. I think we talked about this last week. Um, because half the country voted for her and, and, and you know, do it for them. So it's not for the Clintons. The Clintons deserve to be in jail forever. For the millions and millions and millions of honest Americans who voted for Hillary Clinton, who were unaware of these um, crimes, we've decided to commute her sentence because we don't think it's fair for you, for the person who you worked so hard for, to be in jail. We're not doing it for her. We're doing it for the half of the American people that she swindled. And the one thing I can say about Hillary Clinton, John, before we move on, is as much as I would like to see that woman in prison, I become more and more convinced that Hillary Clinton is in perfect hell right now. That it is that that if Hillary Clinton had been locked up, she'd have a martyr complex and and she'd be made into Joan of Arc and all the rest of it. But the fact that she lost an election that was to the progressive mind Un, un, unimaginable to lose. And the fact that 18 months after the fact, she still can't get over it and still talks about how she won more hairdressers, let's say, than Donald Trump did, um, means to me that from the moment um, mid to late afternoon on that uh, first November of uh, 2016, first Tuesday in November, um, From that instant, when she began to, wait a minute, hold on now, what's this? And then within an hour, she's like, we're in actual trouble here. And then she started drinking, which is why she didn't come out. She was roaring drunk, sent out John Podesta. From that moment, she's been in the kind of hell that only people with that kind of ego can be in. People with genuine humility and character can't be in the kind of agony of... Um, rage that Hillary Clinton is in. I don't think, I'm sure Mitt Romney wasn't happy about losing. I'm sure Mitt Romney was surprised and, and, and somewhat depressed about losing the election. He put a lot of work into it. But I don't suspect that it destroyed Mitt Romney. But Hillary Clinton is, she was bonkers to begin with. The woman's barking mad. Barking mad insane, absolute psychopath, and has enormous health problems. We don't know what they are. But enormous, 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 enormous physical problems. 